So I just want to pick up where we left off last time. So just but please do, do let me know if, if you're if it's getting too fast, right? So we were asking this question, right? So I, you know, last time I, I actually argue, argued that uh, we, we, we had these examples of these measures and we showed when they're absolutely continuous with respect to a Gaussian measure, right? And that can be used to prove this kind of relationship. Now I said that there were these boundary cases where we couldn't prove this, like 2D Navier-Stokes um, and, and, uh, and KPZ with, with rough forcing. Um, but we could still actually prove this, or at least not this. We can actually prove this, you should. But right today, I'll show you that they're not singular. So let me just give you a quick argument to show how that works, because that leads into where I'm going next, all right? So again, I recall if we define the semi-group like that, and then if we differentiate with respect to the initial data, so maybe you should think, I think later in the text, let me put a zero here just to make it clear. So if you differentiate with respect to the initial data in a direction, so this is like a uh, Fourche derivative, if you will. And if I differentiate in this direction, then if I could bound that by L infinity times the size of that direction, I'm, that would be some kind of smoothing estimate that the analysts in the room would recognize. Like, oh, smoothing, all right? So, uh, and let me show you how that relates to the previous conversation. So if I pick a curve, it starts at, uh, should have said, is it should, okay. So I just picked starting from some point zero. Uh, okay, that's fine. So, so if, right, oh no, I see, I see, I did. I did, I did something smart. I did something different than I usually did. Ah, how smart, John. Okay, good. All right, so, and if I want, so now notice if I pick this curve that starts at zero and ends up at C, yeah? Then this difference here, right? See it at, at point at time s at, at this is gamma at one and this is gamma at zero, right? Yeah. So if I differentiate in gamma, and this is just the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? And I just integrate and I have this, and then I apply that estimate, right? And now I get this, which is just the length of C. I get the exact estimate that I wanted from, I mean, from that estimate above, I get this fact in fact, right? Which, which then, because the total variation norm is one half the soup over such test functions where phi, where, uh, where phi is, whoops, that's not the soup over that. I should have said the soup over, oh, there it is. I just shouldn't say psi, it should say phi. Right, the soup of our test functions, L infinity test functions bounded by one. There you go, now you can see it. Since this is true, this estimate here, which I wrote down again below, right, which is just saying if I start from a delta measure and I push forward those two delta measures, this is actually, um, oh wow, I really made lots of typos, right? This says that the total variation distance between these two measures is actually continuous in the base point, right? And of course that means when you make, bring them close together, if you bring them close enough, this number becomes less than one. And the minute this number is less than one, they're no longer singular. And then the coupling arguments I made before show you that there's a unique invariant measure, at least for measures that are supported in that little ball. You can actually show that they're equivalent with a little extra work. All right, so, so you can kind of see the utility of getting estimates like that, yeah? Right, and that's kind of the classic analyst approach to thinking about things and can be souped up. All right, all right. Now, oh, this kind of estimate, what we're gonna do is we're gonna develop some integration by part size. All right, so first of all, if I differentiate this with respect to the initial data, that's the same as just using the chain rule under, this ex, under the expectation. Mm -hmm. um, and if I do that, I get the gradient of the text function and then the Jacobian, the linearization of the solution with respect to this initial data. And what do I mean by the initial, by this linearization? Well, what I mean is let's just go ahead and write some equation here. Just we're going to proceed kind of formally, assuming you can make sense of everything that I say, then you're fine. Well, what is that? If I write, that's just notation for an integral equation, right? So I write this out, the integral formulation. And now the solution is a function of time, sure enough, but it's also a function of the initial data and the W that I put in, right? So we're gonna learn how to differentiate in this and differentiate in this. 
That's the idea. Okay, that that is malleable calculus. Malleable calculus, rightly named, is named after Malleable because he had the idea to actually prove things like this. But it, you could really call it the stochastic calculus of variations, and that's I think certainly probably maybe at least Bismuth definitely called it that at one point. I think. All right. So what will we do? Well, here let's just take that map. Let's perturb the initial data, subtract them, and divide by the epsilon. Right. I mean, that's what a derivative means. Now, the only question is in what sense does it converge and does it converge in all directions and all the normal technicalities. But at the level of caution of the wind conversation we're having here, you know, assuming you can make sense of it, this must be the derivative, right? And so that's my directional derivative. And, it, when, and in this additive noise case, actually the Malyavan derivative corresponds with the Fourche derivative most of the time. So you can just think of the Fourche derivative. So you shouldn't be scared of anything. Unless you're scared of for shader of it, and then, well, <laughs> a conversation we have to have. <laughs> Can't be afraid of both Malian derivatives and for shader derivatives at a conference about PDs and randomness. Yep. You can choose one or the other. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So then we end up with, we differentiate. Okay. Now, so what happens if we were to subtract those two equations? Let's just look at that. Let's actually subtract those two equations, right? So I claim that this is the derivative. If you just proceed it formally, it's what you'd get, right? Differentiating. And I go ahead and define, since this thing is time inhomogeneous, this linear operator, I define a time inhomogeneous flow that propagates from perturb perturbations at S to time T. But just, if this isn't obvious to you, you just do what you always do. You just those. You write out the integral equation, the integral equation that we had above, and then you write out the second one where I perturbed the initial data, and that's this u epsilon, right? And I subtract u epsilon, u from u epsilon, divide by epsilon. Well, under the integral sign, I have two different b's. I just Taylor series expand that, and I get this, right? And then I take the limit and I get this equation right here. That's what that's all it is. That's where it comes from. It's nothing magic, yeah. All right, there, that's what we get. And then you recognize that this is that equation written above, right? All right, now I'm going to define the Malyavan derivative, which is just the Fréchet derivative, where I'm now going to perturb the noise, the Wiener process, with respect to some function h. So that Wiener process is some path, some continuous path on a time interval in some space. And I'm going to add some new path, which will have some properties, OK? All right, it'll turn out to be H1 in time and have zero initial condition. That's basically what it is. Oh, H1 in time, zero initial condition. There it goes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so since it's H1 in time, I can write it as the integral of an L2 function, which I write as little h, yeah? And I subtract these two, divide by epsilon. What else could the derivative possibly be, right? And now I do the same thing. I define a W epsilon, which is W minus plus epsilon H. And then I drive the two different equations. Now I have the U epsilon driven by the W epsilon, yeah? And now I subtract the U epsilon from the U and divide by epsilon. Again, what else could the derivative be? All of my nose, Taylor series, expand. Now when I subtract W from W epsilon, remember the only difference between W and W epsilon was I had this H added on. The W's cancel out, and I'm left with just this, yeah? Just the H, yeah? So now I simplify things a bit, and I get this equation, right? In yellow, yeah? And then I recognize that equation as what? The linear equation I had before with the time inhomogeneous forcing. <laughs> so I learned about variation of constants, Duhamel's principle, linear superposition, whatever your people call it. And you can then write that as just integrating the, the homogeneous solution against the inhomogeneous forcing. And so you can actually get this operator AT, which I'm just writing on the derivative of that big function H, just because it's going to be convenient with what comes next. So to integrate by parts, what I need to do, all right, so what happened? I was starting at u naught, and I went along, and I ended up, thank you, Jessica, and I ended up at u of t, yeah? And then I made some perturbation c here, yeah, in the initial data, right? In the tangent plane here, yeah? And that took me here in this direction, and that was 0 t c, yeah? 
But there is also this Wiener process down below that was driving this, yeah? And so I could also, there's also some perturbation on top of that, yeah? And that was my W epsilon plus, which is equal to W plus epsilon H, yeah? And that created some perturbation, which was, which is, right? What I do is I wanna transfer the variation from the initial data to the Wiener process variation. Because if I do that, then I can integrate by parts in the Wiener process. Because the Wiener process is a Gaussian measure. It's an interdimensional Gaussian measure, but Gaussian measures, I mean, we use them for mollifiers. They're so smooth, right? They're like the smoothest, the smoothest, the smoothest. The only thing more smooth than a Gaussian is a constant. Right? Okay, so we want to find. So now, so now I'm. Uh, Okay, so now this, this idea, so, so what we want to do is we want to find a, uh, so I didn't actually, I said this kind of backwards. How did I, would I say it? Huh, okay, so I didn't say it. So what we want to find is we want to find a, we want to find a H so that this is true. Find H so this is true, okay? Yeah? Yes, please, sir. I need to put a DW. Where, where, where are you talking? Are you talking here? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I do. That's just wrong. That's just, a, that's just a typo. I actually made that typo somewhere else, and I copied it, and I thought I fixed it. You're 100% correct. I just made it. That's just my brain, my brain acting out of order. Okay, so this one I'm about to show you is actually something called the bis. I'm about to drive something called the bismuth Alworthy Lee formula. And so what I want to what I want to show you, I want to point out the following. So let's say I make this pick. I make this pick. Now, of course, there's a ton of assumptions that went into making that pick. Again, we have our old friend Q inverse, which I need to have something about the solution in the range of Q inverse, right? So this is some kind of ellipticity argument, right? In a way. So if I do this, let's pick this. For some, this is just a weight, which is positive, non-negative, and it integrates to one, yeah? It's useful sometimes to have. And if you do this, <laughs> look what happens. Now, if I take this H and I apply A to it, remember I just had the semi-group Q applied to the H, right? But the H is, a, is, a inver is, is Q inverse first, so those drop out. And then what happens when I first evolve from zero to time S, and then I evolve from S to time T. That's the same as evolving from time zero to time T, which in particular is independent of S. So I can move it outside the integrand, right? And then I have this weight function, which integrates to one. Why might you want the weight function? You might want to keep it away from the endpoints because you might have singularities in your heat kernel, in your J, because it's an elliptic equation, right? It's regularizing properties maybe worse near the two endpoints, okay? And so then you get that, okay? And somewhere, right? Okay, so okay, so 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 uh, so now this I this I this was the idea in the bismuth Euler Lee formula. So now that gave us the connection between these two derivatives, which I wrote in different notation right here. The derivative in space and the derivative in the noise, yeah. Derivative in the initial condition and the derivative in the omega, yeah. It's scary when you're asking me questions about this, okay? <laughs> that means she's almost certainly politely pointing out a mistake I made. What you said, what was, I didn't understand she made. Oh, I see what this is doing. This is a, this is meant to be the derivative of the whole thing. This is supposed to be the derivative of the whole thing. I haven't integrated my parts yet. The next statement is now Gaussian integration by parts formula, which follows from Grassano's theorem. If I had 15 more minutes, or if you want to ask me at lunch, I'll go to you on the blackboard. Okay. But I made a strategic choice to not show that to you today because of time. All right. And there's lots of different ways to see it. If you read about it in some books, you'll see it as a Fourier multiplier theory against the Hermite polynomials, and it will look complicated unless you learn calculus by 
Fourier multiplier, which maybe some of you did. <laughs> I'm a simple American. I learned it by subtracting two things and dividing by the difference. <laughs> um, so, so I learned integration by parts a different way, and uh, doing it with respect to uh, doing it with respect to Gersonov is a very easy way to see this formula. But this is true. So this is really nice because what it lets us do is it lets us take. Right, I haven't got there yet. Your formula is coming right up. Here's your formula. <laughs> well, this is just the integration by parts. Your formula is right. I would call this your formula. <laughs> See, it even says so. There you are. All right, so this is still with respect to omega shume. All right, so this is, this is just my integration by parts. So now I have this. But what's nice about that is I can take this derivative. I'm throwing it against the hidden Wiener measure, which is here inside this expectation. And it brings down this factor from upstairs. Okay, you'll have to trust me. That's what it does. Okay. Then what you can do is you get this formula, which is the bismuth Elworthy elite, which says that the derivative in space can be represented as this test function just integrated against this, this particular control, which I wrote down. And the beauty of that, the beauty of that, of course, is that now I've taken a function which I don't need to make sense of this. I don't need for phi to be differentiable. I just need an L infinity bound, all right? And so you then, for instance, you can do a thousand different things. Here, I just applied Cauchy-Schwartz, and then I got stupid about how I valued Cauchy-Schwartz and just pulled out an L infinity. But the point was made just in case you want, didn't want it. You wanted to have an L2 instead of an L infinity bound. You could have done that just as easily. At the level of I've told you nothing about the equation, about any assumptions. I mean, already it's like five, five is just an alphabet, right? Uh, and the thing, there no. be some kind of blow up at times or No, no. I mean, not in, R, not in RN, not if it's elliptic. No. Yeah, it is. It's regular. It's an RN. All norms are equivalent. P SPD, yes, maybe. <coughs> and depending on what directions I'm different. At T equal to zero. The density blows up, but not PT to zero. Blows but up. not PT. Yeah. I'm not taking T to zero. T is positive. T is positive. Oh, okay. So no, I just thought it would, it would no, it's right here. It's right here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, yeah, there could be a, there, yeah. This C depends on T. Okay. All right, so that's the Bismuth Elworthy Lee formula. Yes, you may? We agree? All right, good. That's going to go home and cry. All right. So that's great. That's fantastic. Except, and a lot of great work in SPDs was done with this, but the problem was this. Right, that assumption, right? That's the sticky wicket. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to where we started. That's the sticky wicket. Okay. I've won Dallas over for the day at least. All right. So now let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to this simple example. And just to make my point, let me write an infinite dimensional version of that, the heat equation. All right. And on the interval of this with the Zero boundary conditions, Dirichlet boundary conditions. All right. Now let's just do something simple. Let's take two different initial conditions, u and u tilde, and let's write rho as the difference between them. Yeah. And let's subtract them. I think everyone, somehow I didn't manage to actually write what the equation rho satisfies. I just started estimating right away. <laughs> what equation would rho satisfy then? It would satisfy this equation. All right. So. <clears throat> So rho satisfies that equation, right? No matter what the noise is, you can make the noise the craziest noise you've ever heard of. You can make it fractional Brownian motion, levy processes, the heart, the heart rate of your younger sibling, right? Right, whatever you, whatever you want, right? It drops out. Just do the standard L2 estimate. I right, multiply by L2, integrate by parts here. Not noisy integration of parts, but just regular old L2 integration of parts. Use the fact that I have a point Poincare estimate because I'm on a Dirichlet boundary conditions, right? And so I get this, and then guess what? I have this estimate. And what does that mean? That means that these paths converge to each other with probability one. So instead of, so if in that same argument I made before, where with my coupling argument, I made them go at time t and then stick together forever, right? Now I can just make the paths agree asymptotically as they go out to infinity. So I can use a test function, which is continuous or lip, lip one, if you want, right? And then 
I have that this time average difference from this time average goes to zero as t goes to infinity, right? So now I've proven that there's a unique one invariant measure for this system, no matter what the noise looks like. Because what I've used is dynamic properties, right? I have, I've made dynamic smoothing, not probabilistic smoothing. Now this smoothing is not quite as strong. It doesn't say that I have a group, something which is not differentiable, which then in finite time becomes differentiable, right? What it says is I have something with a certain size gradient, which in finite time gets a smaller gradient, which then gets a smaller gradient, and then gets a smaller gradient, and that just keeps going, right? And yeah, until you run out of space, until you reach infinity. Yeah? Right. So if we had had. So uh, we're done now. <laughs> I can leave. I've made Scott happy. <laughs> now, if I can just remember to switch the screen, then I'll make Jessica happy and I'll be on my way. And well, <laughs> yeah, Jacob's already left. <laughs> so I guess that boat sailed. All right. All right. So, so let's just take. <laughs> Let's take invariant, these two ergodic invariant measures. Remember, we said with Burkhoff's ergodic theorem, we could make, pick them so that these two things agreed almost surely. And then I use this argument to determine that these are identical. Same argument as before, yeah? Just to drive the point home, I can pick Qs easily so that the Q is non degenerate in the sense that any analyst would think, but I'm in infinite dimensions now. This is right. Maybe I should write QQ star. I guess, to make it look like a quadratic form. Okay. But the measures are singular. So this idea that I had to have absolute continuity or non-singularness at finite time is not required. I just gave you the simplest example you can imagine that has unique ergodicity, right? All right, so the idea is the vorticity formulation. There's no reason really to use vorticity uh, exactly. I do, I, it's nice to have the extra vorticity vorticity conserved estimate, which makes life easier here. Uh, write these equations. Let's force a bunch of directions, some directions in a set Z. Now let's do the same kind of idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix the two ideas, right? Before, I'm going to kind of mix the fact that I had some shift in the Brownian motion. So I'm going to go kind of back to macroscopic for a moment. I'm going to shift the Brownian motion here with some, so some W tilde by putting some that's supposed to be a sigma, not a sum, times some h that I have here, right? And now if I define the difference between the two q's, what equation do I end up with? Uh, oh, I left out one of the terms. I went ahead and canceled out the other term. It will eventually go away. But uh, I guess in good taste, I should have it here from the beginning. So I have these three terms on the left-hand side and that term, yeah? Agree? That's just subtracting the two equations, just like before, yeah? And using that this is a bilinear form, whoops, using this as a bilinear form and just symmetrizing the difference of the two, yeah? Okay, <clears throat> so now if I let pi be a projection onto this span, so I'm thinking of these sigma k's as being a finite set, and I'm thinking of them as spanning all the low modes. And this is very much related to, when I first started thinking about this, actually, this was all in terms of kind of reduction to the unstable manifold, foyash prodi estimates, it was things like that. I'm not presenting it to you this way today. Maybe if I have time, I'll say something about it, but, but here are the ideas. So now let me pick an H, <coughs> which looks like this actually, yeah, which looks like this, okay, for a second. And now if I, so why did I do that? Because I wanna kill the, low, the projection onto pi of this term, and then I want to introduce this term because it's super nice and contracting. And if I do that, so the thing that's true about the Navier-Stokes equation is that when I take the inner the vorticity formation in 2D on the torus, if I take the inner product with rho, this term drops out. Yeah? Okay, it's just integration by part due to incompressibility. If I do that and then take the inner product, I get the following thing. I get the, the projection onto the, I get two equations. I first, I take the inner product with respect to rho, Projected onto the low modes, onto the pi, the domain range of pi, and the complement. Okay. And for the one of them, I get the top equation, and for the other one, I get the bottom equation. 
The bottom equation has no nonlinearities because I killed it out with H. And then it has this, this viscosity term here, and then it has a one. Because when I take the inner product of this with rho on the low modes, I get rho square, the norm over the norm, and I get minus one. That's fun. And then I get this on the high modes, yeah? And here's the point. This, I can neglect that and solve it. It looks like that, right? I mean, if I get rid of this term, I think we can all solve that equation. It's like on that list of two that I can solve. The other one is x dot equals minus x. I don't quite know what to do if it's plus x. All right, so <laughs> thanks for laughing. All right, so then you can, you can then take this equation and this is positive. So obviously when T is bigger than this, it doesn't make sense somehow. I had to cross through zero. So it's zero, okay? So if I pick this, I actually drive the low modes to zero. Yeah, I mean, I could have done lots of things. You can actually asymptotically force them. Other papers have done that, but for pedagogical reasons, it's useful to have this. So now what? Let's now look at just the remaining, the projection onto these high modes where I don't have any forcing. No, who said H is blowing up? Who said H is blowing up? I, I would say you're wrong. I'll get to it in just a second. I will see. Just since you asked Isabel, pi is projecting onto a finite low dimensional mode, right? So it's just a finite dimensional vector, some vector in Rn, yeah? We know rho, we're about to see that rho is going to zero exponentially. It's going to zero exponentially. This thing is going to zero. The second one, this is only not, this is, uh, I see what you're saying. So you're worried that this is H squared of H over H. Uh, actually, you're right. So I short circuited an argument last night, but it's L2 all in, uh, it just needs to be integrable, but it should be square integrable. Okay. I, I, I think it is integrable. I, there's, I, I simplified something which I may have short circuited wrong. So, okay. So I don't want to try to fix it on the spot, but um, I now I see what you're saying. Thank you. Um, yeah, it just needs to be integrable in time. So, but let's just, let's just take a second, ignore that difficulty for a second. It, I just tweaked something and I should have maybe tweaked it in my last night. So here's the point. If I take this equation now, just look at this is where the real magic happens. I mean, I could have just made this go to zero slower if I wanted to, right? I could have, I could have made this something that I didn't need to make this exactly this. I could have made this a, a different power so that it would definitely be integrable in time, square integrable, right? I just needed it to be something that drove it to zero in finite time, right? Right. So the fact, which is the thing I tweaked, the fact this was exactly the one over square root h was a mistake on my part, probably. Okay. So now what? So these are just some classical for Navier-Stokes estimates. They fall into the regime. If you've seen them before, you know them instantly. And if you've never seen them before, I'm not gonna explain them to you now. What they say, right, is they say that you can bound QQ by Q in H1, Q in L2, and this one in L2. If you're trying to do it in your head and you're almost close to getting it right, the trick is to do an L4 estimate and then use sublimit better, okay? And then we use the standard polarization to take this part and split it off and give it there, squaring it and introducing a new over two and then taking this part off and squaring it. And I should have had a new in the bottom, which I forgot, okay, yeah. So now if I use that inequality, what I get when I close things, when I close things, I get this estimate, okay? Cause that's great though, because now, and here I've used Poincaré inequality. And the beauty thing, the really the point to emphasize, here's the point, is that when I use point creative quality, now I'm on the complement of these modes. So there's some smallest eigenfunction, which, which depends on the span of the sigma k's, which I get an enhanced point creative estimate. So now I can just integrate this up. I can Gersonoff it. I mean, not Gersonoff it. I can uh, uh, Gromwald it, sorry. I should be shot for making everything a verb. All right, so if I do that, then I have this perpendicular part. Here we go. I have this part, and now I've pulled out the time here, and I've turned this into a time average, just to make it really clear. This is just the time average of the energy, I mean, of the LH1 norm of the vorticity, right? And that has, you can prove then that that has a nice time average. That converges in stationary to some number, yeah? And you can get an a priori estimate on that, and so then you can make 
by picking what sigma k's you were forcing, you can make this as big as you want. And so if you make that big enough, this term will asymptotically be negative and start converging to zero exponentially. Yeah? Because as soon as this crosses some finite number under, 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 under this one, it starts to go exponentially. And you can prove that that happens with the Borel Compelli argument, you can prove that that happens almost surely eventually, and it decays exponentially. You can even show that it happens in expectations of, with some certain stopping times if you want. All right. So we've shown that this goes to zero almost surely, and in fact, exponentially for large time, it's tending to zero. Yeah? Okay. I started off by saying we can use the noise to, to, to drive two solutions together, and then great. We have a smoothing estimate on a guy here. I said, or you can use contraction in the system to drive things together. Now what I've done is I have some unstable manifold and some stable directions. I've used the noise to drive the equations together on the unstable manifold. And then once they match up on the unstable manifold, the stable directions contract. And so I kind of call this essentially elliptic. It's elliptic in all the directions that could mess you up, all the unstable directions. And the directions that are stable, you don't have to worry about because the noise is making you contract anyway. I mean, the, the dynamics are making it contract. So we're mixing dynamics and probabilistic arguments inherently in all this stuff. Okay, the thing that's important is we need to do this all the way up to time infinity because this only happens at infinity when they drive to each other. So I have this control. So I've skipped a little bit the part of this lectures where I should talk a lot about Kersanov's theorem. But we already saw a little bit about Kersanov's theorem, right? I showed you how the, the, the change in measure was proportional somehow to the, the L2 norm of the, of the shift that I did, right? So now I need to make sure that that L2 norm of that shift is finite all the way out to positive infinity. So how much did this change in measure cost in terms of probability? Well, I look at this H that I had. And so, yeah, I screwed up there, right? See, I just wrote, oh, it's like one. <laughs> so, but that's fixable. Okay, I'm sorry, I made a little bit of a simplification. So there's a small bug there, but, but the point is, is that the norm here is proportional to a constant, should have been like that, right? This term is what's important. And I'll fix that. Is, is just, if I bound, because it's finite dimensional here, I don't have, I don't have to worry about anything, right? I can actually, this is finite dimensional. Uh, let's see, do I wanna make sure I'm right? Okay, maybe I need one H1 but it, uh, it's fine, okay, sorry. The, on your... yeah, the constant depends on my truncation, yeah. So on the whole yeah. Uh, truncation depends on your... Well, but the truncation is determined ahead of time. I just need to, it only depends on the energetics. It only depends on this energetics. This is the, my truncation only depends on what this average is to. But, but that I have almost sure, I have an expectation I have. So the infinite time I have, so that's another thing you have to do, but that's just, some application of Ito equation to standard energetic estimates from average stokes equation. All right, so, so then we get that this is finite cost. So there exists a coupling which drives these together at time infinity is what you'll derive from that, okay? All right, so there's some work to be done there to make, to make that all right, but I, I kind of chose to not overdo that part. Okay, so this somehow is an essentially elliptic or effectively elliptic. I have various papers, I haven't made up my mind what I should call it. So it requires somehow that the span of the directions that I force sufficient, covers sufficiently many low modes so that it covers all the directions that are kind of asymptotically on average unstable, right? They could instantaneously be stable or unstable, but just on average as you integrate over long periods of time. Okay, so are there any questions about that? Oh, I could have put an H1 on here or something. It wouldn't matter. And I could have gotten the contraction estimates in H1 also. I mean, the idea is, I mean, right, all the estimates are depend on the setting. And if I screwed one of them up, which I don't think I did, because this, the power of this pi here is quite strong, right? Right. I mean, I have the B of sub art kernel here, right? Right. So I can put a derivative on here and that kills that, right? And then I can put as many, and you're worried about I'm right at the threshold, but I can put as big a derivative as I want on that because I can put with respect to a finite dimensional vector and integrate by parts and move that in there. Anyway, I can show you afterwards. <coughs> there's a lot of magic of having this projection. Okay. I'll write down the precise one, but there's, there's a constant. It's, 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 re it's related to the Grashoff <coughs> number. Yeah. So it, it grows like the Grashoff number. 
the, the, the energetics. And then you have to just do counting the modes in that. So it grows like the radius of the ball grows like the grass shot number, I think. Okay. Or the eigenvalue. I had to translate it back to the number of modes. But this, the object that scales is like the grass shot number in that fluid. Okay. So I could have produced, I could have proceeded infinitesimally. I could have proceeded infinitesimally. Okay, so this part here was kind of work that I did with, with, with Yakov Grigorievich Sinai and Wayne Anu. Um, and then eventually, so then the kind of thinking about this infinitesimal point of view was something really that came out of my conversation with Martin Hare and eventually led to our paper where we answered the question like, what we'd like to do is have a situation where we didn't have viscosity dependent, right? We didn't need to worry about what the energetics of how much energy was being pumped in and what the viscosity was. We wanted a hypoelliptic statement that didn't require that, okay? And one of the important things, although you can do it without this, I think, but one important step at that time for sure was to think about doing this infinitesimally. It decoupled some things in a nice way, probabilistic. Okay, so, so remember before when I derived the, the bismuth Elworthy Lee formula, I actually found a way <laughs> to make these two things exactly equal, right? Derivative with respect to the initial data and the derivative with respect to the noise, yeah? In fi finite time, they're exactly equal. And now I've kind of argued that I can't make these two paths come together at finite time. I can only make them come together asymptotically at infinity. So it's reasonable to expect that at finite time, I'm never going to make these two equal. I'm never going to exactly compensate. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to drive this difference to zero asymptotically at infinity. The linearization, this was the, this my event derivative. Remember, they, this was just the inhomogeneously forced version of this equation. So this is just like adding initial data, which I forgot, then rho zero equals C. If I set rho equal to this difference, then rho zero equals C, and this is true. This is the equation you end up with, which looks a lot like the equation I just had, in fact, because it's a bilinear form, in fact, but this is a general. These arguments here are rather general. They don't just apply to average stones. You can use them for lots of things. So now you want to find a Q that drives this infinitesimal perturbation to zero. Okay, and if you do that, and you have the following argument, which mirrors exactly how I started off the hour. In the same calculation as before, I differentiate with respect to initial condition C. That just brings out the Jacobian, right? Linearization. I now stick in the definition of rho, so this is equal to the, the Malia, this Malian derivative plus this difference, right? I then integrate by parts and get out this constant here, and I'm left with this row, right? Now, I just do the same thing as before. I Cauchy shorts, I can do whatever I want. You can hold it, you can Cauchy shorts, you can infinity bounds, do whatever you want. And after these estimates, what am I left with? I'm left with this estimate, see? I'm left with the gradient of the initial condition, is bounded by something which is L infinity, which could have been L2 if I want to, in the problem that came from here. And then something which is the gradient of this, omega t, where omega t is just the expected value of this rho t. <coughs> and the idea, and we know that rho t, for instance, in many cases, you may, that you might have to condition or you might just be able to take straight expectations, goes to zero asymptotically as t goes to infinity. That's the idea. And so, um, Oh, and I, there was, I got distracted by a phone call. I meant to put, there's supposed to be another box there telling you where the other inequalities. So there's different versions of this. There's a version of this, which goes back to the 50s, which is INESCU. I'll find it during the break. I forgot that it is. And then later there are versions of this, which go under the name of Lesotho York inequality. And there's a whole bunch of different variations on this idea, but it's balancing two different norms. So in some sense, I have an infinity norm here, an operator with the infinity norm here, oh, I'm sorry, I have a gradient norm here, sorry, this infinity norm here, and then I have the same norm balancing it, but the, but the constant in front of it's going to zero, right? And that lets you conclude things asymptotically, okay? <clears throat> and it turns out that this, which is what we call asymptotic strong Feller estimate, kind of this gradient smoothing estimate, and we as Martin Hare and myself, uh, is enough to prove unique ergodicity, much like having those paths converged. You can actually use this inequality to prove that in a neighborhood of an initial point, there is a coupling that's followed with positive probability, with it with positive probability makes the paths actually converge to each other. So we really lost nothing, okay? And some, 
So we, we have the ability to now have these paths that converge to each other in theta. So the whole game turns into finding the H so that this perturbation and in initial condition goes to zero asymptotic. But I don't want to use ellipticity. I don't want to use that I have noise in every direction that I'm trying to kill off all the unstable directions. I want to somehow use hypoellipticity. I want to use the fact that I can force a few modes somewhere and then they spread out to the scale of the unscale modes that I want to get rid of. So if I'm going to have that conversation with you, I need to go back and explain the, the most rudimentary parts of kind of hypoellipticity as seen from kind of a dynamical point of view. Right, so seen from the paths of the process, not from their average effect, which is the PD point of view. Okay, because I intrinsically want to pair this with pathwise contraction. So, in these arguments, at least, all right, are there any questions so far? Professor Herzog in the back. Hi. Hi, how are you this morning, David? I'm fine. I, I was going to ask, like, if you go back to that, go, I don't, I don't know which slide it is, but when you choose H to be like Q inverse times that other thing. The, yeah, the, the bismuth or the lead choice. Yeah, so do you, you don't get any extra mileage if you choose to be Q star times that? So it looks like. Well, Q star maps the wrong spaces for okay. starters. Okay. okay. But if I happen to have Q defined from space to space, I don't think so, Dave. I mean, the point is it has to be, you don't get to choose Q. I mean, I mean, oh, so you're saying because then I'd have Q times Q star in the middle? Yeah, yeah, right. So you'd have Q Yeah, Q star I mean, the point is, is that, okay, if you're thinking about this from the, if you're thinking about this from the, the, the like, the noise was really the diffusion, Yeah. then I took the square root of a positive definite symmetric matrix anyway. Yeah. And so I chose Q, I chose Q star to be self-adjoint, right? Yeah. Right? So it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Is that cool? Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm choosing it to be Q inverse, right. which is kind of. Okay. Sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So in the last four minutes ish, right? Is that right? Six minutes, three minutes, minus four. Is my, oh, I'm supposed to stop at 20. Okay. Then I'll stop. Done. All right, I got an hour in my head. 15 minutes, you're absolutely correct. So when we come back, I will tell you about the beginnings of hypoelipticity and how I'll sketch how to do this in this setting. I'm not gonna give you all the details. I don't think it's fruitful. But it's not because it's hard, it's just because it's lots of analysis. It's not lots of analysis, it's just that.